General C.Q. Brown, the 22nd Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Welcome to Veterans in Transition, and it's really, really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. And we really appreciate it. I know how busy you are in the Pentagon, so thank you so much for joining us. Well, Larry, it's you know it's always good to see you, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity because you know you were one of my uh, one of my mentors uh, way back when. So hopefully, I'm uh, doing well by you. But it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Well, well, despite that, you did well anyway. So so thank you. Uh, so let's let's uh, let's get started. Uh, now, as you know, I've known uh, you and your wife Shireen for a long time since you were captain. And in fact, you were the aide de camp to uh, the chief of staff of the Air Force at the time when we were neighbors at Bowling. And so people often ask me, uh, you know, tell me about Chief Brown, you know, Chief Brown. Uh, you know, how is he? What kind of guy is he? And, you know, that's, that's an easy question for me to answer. You know, you've got an impeccable record. You're a warfighter, uh, smart guy, uh, great leader. Uh, you've got an impeccable record, uh, unimpeached integrity except for one area, and, and, and I'm clear about that, that you are a Dallas Cowboy fan, and that, that takes you down a few pegs in my eyes, but, but, but I, I, I excuse you for that because you were born and raised in Texas, so that, that kind of makes sense. Um, so just so folks can know just a little about you as an individual, uh, how was it growing up in Texas, and how did you decide to join the U.S. Air Force? Well, before I start that, though, I also say I think you have a character flaw. That you're <laughs> right. <laughs> I, uh, we don't see eye to eye in certain areas. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I'm originally from San Antonio, um, uh, born there. Both my parents were born and raised there. Uh, uh, my dad went to college in uh, in St. Mary's there in San Antonio, and then his first assignment was Fort Hood. Uh, shortly after I was born, and then uh, he went to Vietnam. And so we bounced around, but spent quite a bit of my four years in uh, Texas. And then uh, about middle school, we went to Germany. And then we ended up in, uh, uh, my dad was stationed in Fort Monroe. And uh, that actually, um, I graduated from high school there in Newport News, Virginia. And then I knew I wanted to get back to Texas. So I knew my parents had moved before uh, I graduated from college. So I went, ended up going to Texas Tech, uh, sign on the scene, on, on an ROTC scholarship. And uh, my dad had taught ROTC after his second tour in Vietnam. Um, he had talked to me about the academies. Uh, I was not that interested in the military, uh, but he encouraged me then to uh, apply for ROTC scholarships to help pay my way through school. And uh, I uh, got to the aspect of uh, getting selected to go to the interviews for all three. I did not go to the Navy interview because I knew I didn't want to do the Navy. Uh, did both Air Force and Army and uh, got both scholarships. And then my dad recommended Air Force because uh, I was pursuing a dual degree in architecture and civil engineering. Uh, ended up with just a civil engineering degree. I got washed out of architecture. Um, <laughs> But he knew that I would probably have a better chance of being an engineer in the Air Force than, uh, than in the Army. And so that's what me, put me in the path of the Air Force. And, and uh, it was been exciting because uh, I was going to be four years to get out uh, as an engineer. And uh, I got a T-37 ride at ROTC summer camp. And uh, that, that changed my mind about, uh, you know, the Air Force itself and what I wanted to do. And at that, that point, I wanted to decide I wanted to become a pilot. And uh, you know, get a pilot slot first semester of my senior year, and then uh, kind of from there, the rest is history. Yeah, that uh, that leads me to my next question because once you decided to become a pilot, uh, obviously you could have been a bomber pilot, a cargo pilot, a helicopter pilot. Uh, you know, there there are a lot of options there, but you chose fighters. What 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 made you want to be a fighter pilot in the United States Air Force? Well, I just, uh, I mean, I think the one aspect was the T-37 ride is, you know, you, you could do a lot of things in the T-37 uh, fighter-like, you know, flying upside down and those kinds of things. Uh, and that was pretty exciting. But I also thought uh, in my my time of uh, research, at one point I thought I wanted to be an astronaut, you know, and uh, many people may not know that. I thought about that. And, you know, one way you do that is go to test pilot school and flying fighters was the best way to do that. Uh, I kind of changed my mind at a point that the an advanced degree in engineering was probably not something I wanted to do. So uh, the, the astronaut piece kind of fell away. Um, but I also realized that uh, being very competitive uh, personally, that uh, most, you know, the tops of most of our pod training classes get a chance to go to fighters. And uh, based on that, that's what I knew what I wanted to do. And then, you know, the flying aspect that I got to do in pilot training also proved that to me that this is something I wanted to, wanted to be able to do and be, you know, close to the top of my classes. I could use you know, top of the classes I could get to and then get into fighters and uh, just knowing um, it's, it's a competitive uh, career field. And I just think the attitude of the folks that are in, uh, you know, we all have our personality and it kind of, you know, it, it kind of fit into where I think I wanted to be based on those that I had a chance to meet that had done it uh, previous to me. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, I know I have and many others because the, 
recent uh, uh, video you did on Air Force recruiting video has gone viral. So it was a really great video. And you described, uh, you know, putting your, your helmet on, your visor up, ready to go. Uh, help all of us who have, who have never flown in a fighter. I mean, what is that like to be blasting down the runway and taking off at speeds like that? What, what, what does that feel like? Well, you know, you get to a point, particularly when you get, uh, you know, as you get more and more comfortable in the airplane, you almost feel like the airplane is just part of you. And the fact that it's attached to your body and you're the ones actually helping it maneuver and you become kind of one with the airplane. Uh, I will tell you the one thing I, I probably didn't appreciate it as much uh, while I'm actually flying, I appreciate it more when I watch other aircraft take off because I know what's going on inside of the cockpit. And because uh, when you're in the cockpit, you're, you're staying pretty busy. Uh, but you do have time to, to appreciate it. I think that, you know, there's times that I would uh, really appreciate is the aspect when the weather's really bad. And then we, uh, we take off and you pop up through the weather and the sunshine. And you get, you get to see some things that, uh, from a perspective that a lot of people don't get a chance to see. Sure. And that to me was, uh, that's an exciting part of the, of the mission of being able to fly and be, uh, and, and do some things that, uh, um, a lot of folks don't get a chance to do. And I, I still pinch myself that I've had the opportunities I've had. Absolutely. Um, now, you know, you, you've had a lot of great experience, a lot of good, a great leadership experience. And I'm sure people will appreciate, you know, you don't get selected to be the chief of staff of the Air Force without a lot of experience and a lot of proven leadership ability. And you've had, uh, you know, more than most. Uh, your, your experience during wartime uh, in the Central Theater uh, commanding Pacific Force, uh, Pacific Air Forces, uh, Commandant of the Air Force Weapons School. I mean, you've had Wing Commander. You've had a lot of leadership experience. So, how would you describe your leadership style? Well, I think my uh, my leadership style um, is really couched in four basic leadership tenets, and, and I can trace these back to a interview I did, I did a radio interview I did when I was a high school senior. And it's executed at a high standard, uh, be disciplined in execution, pay attention to detail and have fun. And so when I, I'm, you know, part of me, uh, I'm always being competitive. I always put my, my best foot forward. And I uh, think about my personal credibility, the credibility of the office I represent in this case, in you know, now the chief of staff of the Air Force, United States Air Force. I'm very disciplined you know, with an engineering degree. I'm very process oriented. Um, and so I'm, I'm disciplined and I'm probably, you know, uh, a, I am a rule follower. And that's just kind of how I do things. Uh, but I don't mind shaking things up if I think we're wasting time or, or not having uh, the right approach. Attention to detail, I like to, I like to learn. I like to dig into the details. Um, and then I like to have fun. And uh, I really believe if, if uh, you know, every day is a good day, just some days are better than others. And if we're not having fun doing what we're doing, then we're probably not doing something right. And uh, the things I can control, realize that there's factors outside of my control. But I want to make it... Uh, you know, you know, enjoyable to come to work each day for myself and for those that work around me. And that, to me, I think is important to be inclusive uh, with the team. And uh, I also, the, the main last thing I share with you on this is that I see myself as an action officer, just like any one of our majors, uh, captains, lieutenant colonels here, because we're all in this together trying to get the same thing done. I just have been around a little bit longer and I may have a little more sway on where the decision might go, but I don't have all the answers. And uh, I want to be able to engage with our, our airmen at all levels, um, whether uniform, total force, or civilian, to be able to learn from them so we can together make what might be the, what I see is the best decision for our United States Air Force or whatever the issue is we're having to deal with. Well, great. And, and speaking of all the airmen, I mean, you, I've listened to a lot of the uh, uh, presentations and speeches you've made, and I'm, I'm really impressed with this notion that you continually to to talk to airmen about, and that is reaching their full potential. Uh, whether you're civilian or military, whether you're a pilot, a nurse, a cop, finance, you want everyone in the Air Force to reach their full potential. Uh, and I think that's a great goal. What, is, what are your thoughts about it? What is your vision on how to make that happen? I, what, what can you do to help airmen reach their full potential? Well, what, you know, one of the key things is the, the right environment. In the right environment where they, they feel comfortable uh, engaging on what it is they want to be able to do. And, and what I tell our airmen is um, always ask what you want. This is something I learned when I was in pilot training. Uh, basically, my, my dad had gone through a prayer breakfast with uh, Fred V. Cherry, was a, the speaker, African-American POW during Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew I was going to pilot training. He talked to my dad. My dad passed to me, this to me at uh, pilot training. It was always ask what you want. I think that's an aspect of you know our airmen knowing what they want to go, what they want to do, what they want to be. At the same time, we in leadership provide them those opportunities. 
as, as to, to the max extent possible. And, and then at the same time, we don't have uh, detractors that impact them from reaching their full potential, whether it be uh, discrimination, harassment, extremism, sexual assault, um, you know, bullies, you know, being bullies, whatever the case may be. Um, it's really about how we as leaders ensure that they have all those opportunities. And then at the same time, uh, we nominate them for positions well beyond their own, you know, what they think their own capability might be, because sometimes we will self eliminate because we don't think we're qualified. And uh, I, mean, I mean, quick story. I mean, I, I was aide to General Fogelman. And I did not put in a package. I didn't volunteer. I got a phone call, told me I was being considered two and a half weeks later. I was, uh, you know, I was hired in, in that two and a half weeks. I was hired and then I PCS into the job. Wow. And that was something that, uh, you know, someone put my name in for it unbeknownst to me. Great. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, early on in the, this conversation uh, you, about mentors, uh, and I have found mentors to be extremely uh, important even today. Um, what do you think the importance of mentors are in, in finding and finding and keeping good mentors? Well, I think the, you know, the key aspect of having a good mentor is uh, they have experiences uh, that you haven't had, uh, whether they're even uh, senior or seen it from a different perspective. And I think the real value is having a chance to engage and be able to bounce off, you know, like I said, whatever you want to do, you bounce that off of uh, your mentor to figure out how, uh, as I say, how big your plan B might, might need to be. Because you may have your plan A, uh, but by talking to a mentor, you may need to also have a plan B. And uh, I, I think that dialogue is important uh, to be able to engage and get some, some insight. Uh, by the same token, uh, you know, I like the way you said mentors with an S. Uh, because you can have one mentor and get one perspective. But I really believe that you want to do, as I call it, comparison shopping and, uh, and ask a lot of different questions. And then from there, you may find an unbeaten path that will get you to your goal by talking to somebody um, that maybe has had a different experience. And I think that's an important aspect of being able to gauge. And uh, it's something I personally, I enjoy doing. I enjoy mentoring. I love talking to young people about you know, what, you know, how I got to where I am and those that helped me get to where I am, because uh, I would have my own ideas after uh, being the aide of what I wanted to do. And I got set down uh, because I asked a couple of questions. And if I had done what I wanted to do, I probably would retire as a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, but you know, I had some good mentors that maybe saw something in me and were able to push me into directions that, that helped me to get to where I sit today. Um, and again, this is, another, <laughs> this is another one of those jobs I didn't apply for. You know, yeah, yeah, I, I certainly appreciate that. And, and I, I also still do mentoring today. And uh, to be honest, one of the things I appreciate about mentors is, is they will tell you things that others won't, uh, exactly. even things you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. Um, right. So I, I, I really appreciate a good mentors. Uh, speaking of a mentor of mine, uh, General Colin Powell uh, was a mentor of mine before I ever met him. <laughs> he didn't know it, but he was a mentor of mine. I just like uh, his example. And I try to, to, to watch what, the way he conducted himself. But even as successful as he was, uh, you know, obviously you, you're aware of this, being the uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the, and the Secretary of, of, of State for the United States. Um, but he describes in his books having challenges uh, along the way, even, even having specific bosses uh, that he had to work his way through to continue on his path. Um, I wonder if, if you've had any, any challenges like that, e either individuals or situations where you know, you just had to work your way through it uh, and to get to, to, to continue your path and to reach the, the level of success you have today? Uh, they, you know, I, there has been, most definitely. I think, you know, one of the things for me, particularly being a fighter pilot, uh, many times I was the only African-American in my squadron. Um, and even as a senior officer, uh, a lot of times, again, uh, the only African-American in the room. And so uh, from that perspective, uh, not only was I representing, my, representing myself, I'm representing a whole bunch of people who aren't in the squad or who aren't in the room. And uh, I want to make sure that I get that right. And uh, which, you know, from that perspective, I feel like, and I you know, think you've, you've heard this and I'm sure you experienced it, but you feel like you got to work a little harder just to ensure that uh, those that come behind me have an opportunity. And so for me, that, that, that is pretty, uh, that, that is important. But I, at the same time, I've had uh, situations where I didn't get uh, either positions or uh, specific examples where uh, someone expected less of me. Well, you know, I talked about it in my video because there was one that really stuck out with me where, you know, later on, so they came back to me. You know, I wasn't really expecting much from, from you. I'm glad they told me that because it actually proved, proved the point of what I felt sometimes is people weren't expecting much from me. 
and then uh, you know after that I kind of go after it's all said and done I go how do you like me now I mean I just <laughs> but that's I mean because I I think I can deliver uh, not because of the color of my skin but just who I who I am and I think we got to be able to judge people based on the content of their character not their you know the color of their skin their uh, their background or anything else just, give, just giving everybody an opportunity and a chance I think is probably the most important thing we can do as leaders. Absolutely. In fact, you reminded me of my, one of my own experiences where I was very senior and I went to a job and partly because who I was and partly because I, uh, I, w- I was non-rated. Um, about a year into the job, the uh, individual called me in and said, hey, I, I didn't think you would do this well. So I'm really happy with what you're doing. I'm thinking, I didn't know if that was a compliment or not, but, but, but you know, it is what it is. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the Air Force with uh, space being a part of the Air Force. And so space uh, became a separate service after I retired. Uh, but as you know, better than most being a pilot that the, uh, the Space Force and the Air Force are integral uh, uh, teammates and have to work very closely together. Um, so how are, why do you, what do you think the import, importance of partnering uh, and collaborating with Space Force now that we're, they're a separate force? Well, you know, part, there's two, well, there's several things. Uh, one, um, uh, the Space Force was born out of the, the Air Force. And uh, so we have a, her- a shared heritage. And I think that's that's an important. Uh, I think the other thing I, I think about is the, how much we are dependent on the Space Force for some of the capabilities we, we have. You know, GPS, for example, to allow us to navigate and use some of the high, uh, highly precise weapons that we use for the information we get in order to help make decisions. Um, I think that's an important aspect. And then the other part is that we are, have a responsibility to support. Uh, you know, we do a lot of support uh, for the Space Force. They're more operation, organized and be more operationally focused. And we provide some level of support for them. So we got to work very closely together. Uh, I think the one, if I had to highlight it, one of the great things about having the Space Force is there's someone who's actually uh, a service that is focused on and being able to broaden the understanding of space and what we need to do in space. Uh, I would just say if I had to do, you know, the job I have today and do space at the same time, uh, I probably wouldn't do it as well. And having, uh, you know, Jay Raymond and his team doing this really helps to raise the visibility of uh, uh, our space capabilities, the space force, and how important they are uh, to what we do, not only in the national security environment, but just day to day in our lives and with our economy. Um, and I think it's an important aspect of being able to highlight the, their role. Okay, great. Now, I, I know you've been asked this question a lot, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, and I saw it on a recent uh, interview you had with uh, PBS NewsHour. The question always comes up that, you know, you're the first African-American chief of any military service, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, you know, ha, ha, I, I, so I know you've, you know, you've been asked that question a lot. You know, what is that? What does that feel like? But but you're a busy guy. I mean, you're chief of staff of the Air Force. So you, you aren't, I assume you aren't thinking about that day to day. You're, you're executing the, you know, the, 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 the most lethal Air Force on the planet. Uh, but uh, has it settled in yet uh, what, it, what that accomplishment means? And in addition to that, have you thought about what we can do to make sure you're not the last African-American or person of color in the chief's job or, or uh, a, we've, never, we've never had a female uh, in the chief's job before. So what can we do looking forward to make sure that that's not an anomaly, that you know, a, a person of color or a female becomes chief of staff and nobody thinks twice about it? Well, you know, uh, Larry, I think it, it, it has subtle in, I mean, sometimes there, there's periods where you, you have a chance to stop and think, you know, holy cow, uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard. It is hard to believe. And, but it's hard to believe it's me. You know, it's, it's almost, it, it's almost like an out of body experience when I think about it sometimes, just because um, I'm just me being me. And I just so happen to have this opportunity. And, and that's the, the, the aspect of um, why it's important for me to help make sure that others have the same opportunity. And what has to happen here is how we deliberately develop our talent to make sure, um, just like I was fully prepared to come to this job, and I didn't know there's probably a number of jobs I held that I didn't know, um, you know how all this is gonna come together, uh, but being in the right place at the right time, I had this opportunity. I think we have gotta be able to do the same thing for, for really all of our airmen, and particularly for, for those from some of our diverse backgrounds, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, ethnicity uh, 
gender, uh, sexual orientation. I mean, all those, we just got to make sure that they, they all have a, an opportunity. So we got to consistently develop them because in some cases, um, there's not many in certain career fields and we got to make sure we're paying attention. And that that's an aspect that I have to pay attention to and the rest of our senior leadership to make sure they have those opportunities to be developed and be seen. So they, they get a shot at uh, some of these key positions. Sure. Uh, speaking of diversity, uh, inclusion, and e uh, equity, um, one of the things that's frustrated me, and I, I'd be curious if you've had the same experience, was you know folks uh, who who just did not believe there was an issue, did not believe that there were inequities, did not believe that there were some folks had a little bit uh, tougher road to hold than others. Uh, it, it wasn't frustrating to me those who said I don't understand, uh, because I because that made sense to me, and we could talk about it, but. There were some that said it's just not true, and there are no issues. Uh, these things are made up, uh, and so I wonder if you've had the same experience. And, and if so, how do we at least get everyone on a common understanding? Not this. This is not about right or wrong. It's just sort of making everyone aware of what the issues are. Well, you know, I, I actually have had similar experiences. You know, there's some that don't quite understand because they haven't walked in the, the shoes, whether it's. Uh, you know, African American, in particular, and, and women is another great example where, uh, having talked to a number of women, you know, they see some of the same things that you see from some of our diverse groups. Um, and I, I think one of the key areas that I've seen is, uh, you know, what, what's happened over the course of the past uh, year plus. Uh, after the I made the video uh, back in June of uh, uh, 2020, I actually had some of my mentors and some of the folks I worked for. It didn't fully appreciate the world I had to walk in to be able to do uh, and be successful. And I think it's been helpful, uh, as tragic as some of the events have been, that it's opened the eyes of some of our leaders to, to understand and have, have a better appreciation for some of the challenges that our diverse groups have. And uh, those small group kind of conversations have been very important because uh, now they're more empathetic and they think about it uh, as they start to make uh, the recommendations for key positions, looking at opportunities to make sure everybody has a fair shot. I mean, th that if nothing else, it just you know ensures there's a level playing field and everybody gets a fair shot to compete. And that's something we're going to be thinking about. Are, are we doing that uh, for our various diverse groups? Which will then you know springboard to more and more opportunities when you have a uh, you're selecting for some key positions. You have more and more people that are qualified because we've, we've been focused on giving them the opportunities to do so. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, you know a lot of people view diversity as uh, as as subtraction, uh, and and but that's not what anyone wants. What what we all want is just an equal shot uh, and to make sure we can compete. And we, we, if we get selected, great. If we don't, great. But we had an opportunity to to, to try, and that I think that's all most people want. Uh, one of the things you said along those lines is you want to make sure that when key jobs come up, there is a diverse pool of candidates. Uh, again, not, that's not for selecting anyone, but making sure that, that there's a diverse, that the pool of candidates all qualified uh, are diverse. Um, how, do you, how, can you, how can you achieve that? How can you, you, know, how can you help uh, uh, slates be diverse uh, for key jobs? Well, one of the things for me personally is I got to set the example, and that's exactly what I do. I'm thinking this little guy, I get to hire and interview a lot of people for the key positions within my, uh, my team. And so making sure not only do I have a diverse slate of candidates, but then I actually select a diverse slate of people to actually fill those positions. It's one thing to actually have the diverse slate, but if you don't hire, um, you know, that doesn't help. I think the one thing about having this diverse slate is uh, you don't know who you don't know. And this is an aspect of our United States. There's a lot of outstanding airmen in our Air Force, and I don't know them all. And so maybe having a diverse slate and a chance to interview, and I'd say the same thing for any one of our, our uh, key leaders, whether it's on the officer or enlisted side, to open up their aperture to meet somebody they haven't met before, maybe from a different background. They're going to learn something. Uh, I think the uh, having that diverse slate does two things. Um, it helps us as leaders get to know some other folks that are outside maybe the, our normal um, group that we might engage with or might know, whether it's by uh, race, gender, ethnicity, or based on especially within our Air Force. At the same time, it provides an opportunity for those of diverse backgrounds to be uh, to be interviewed and practice those interviews and get better at the interviews. You, know, you and I both being uh, big NFL fans, and we've talked about this, about the Rooney Rule, and there's a forcing function to 
ensure you have diverse candidates so that they actually get uh, get a chance to be introduced to some of the decision makers you might hire in the future. And I think that's helpful. But uh, you can always backslide too. And that's something we got to pay attention. That's one of the goals I have as a chief of staff as we set some of these things in motion that it doesn't backslide after our, I move on to something else. It becomes you know, it's really part of something we do as in Southern Toronto United States Air Force that endures well beyond my tenure. Yeah, great. I agree. I, uh, and I, I certainly agree with you. Um, I think it's safe to say that most Americans were horrified at what they saw on 6 January. Um, and uh, it sort of highlighted uh, the, the hate groups that we have in our country, unfortunately. Uh, and this is not a political statement. I'm talking on both sides of the aisle. That, I mean, hate groups are, are, are bad, regardless of what the ideology is. Uh, but that recognition led to DOD uh, implementing or instituting a stand down uh, to just talk about hate groups and how they are incompatible with military service. So I wonder in the Air Force, uh, how did that go in the Air Force and what did you learn from that experience? Well, you know, um, you know, I, I had a chance to actually participate in some of the small group conversations uh, here in the Pentagon with some of the uh, uh, you know, office staff uh, here uh, in the Air Force. At the same time, I've had a chance to go out and talk to airmen around the Air Force. And one of the things I do whenever I travel is I always have a, you know either a breakfast or a lunch with airmen. And a uh, small group of airmen, uh, without their leadership in the room, just ask them how it's going. What I found with uh, whether it being the stand down for extremism, uh, the kind of the stand down of small group conversation we had on racial disparity, or what we did vis-a-vis -vis suicide with the resiliency tactical pause uh, by my predecessor, what I think our airmen really appreciated was the chance to have, sit down and have these small group conversations uh, back and forth. And at the same time, to listen to some of their senior leaders that had, were just as challenged as they were. You know, we, we as, just because we're, we're senior leaders doesn't mean we have the, all the answers. And sometimes we struggle and we have similar vulnerabilities. Uh, and I think our airmen really appreciate the fact when you have a, a, one of your senior leaders can come back and go, you know what, this bothers me too. Or I don't know what the right answer is. Uh, but we're going to learn together. And I, I think that provides a, a sense of uh, relief that now we're all, you know, it opens up the conversation. That way um, it helps us to look at how we go forward to ensure we have that environment where they all can reach their full potential because we've actually had a chance to talk through some of this. So it's been good. It was also a good chance for us to really think about uh, our oath of office and our core values, which is another core aspect of the, uh, the conversation we have with our government and how important that, that is to what we do. And that uh, as we talk about some of these, what I would call detractors, there's a small percentage of our airmen that don't get it or have issues. By and large, all of our airmen live up to the oath that they uh, took um, and our core values. And that to me, make, that makes me proud. You know, when we, have, we all have this conversation and we, you know, now the, I think the, the key part for us, it helps us to really uh, take a hard look at ourselves and, and be able to uh, look at how we continue to improve to ensure those kinds of things are not part of what we do inside of our Air Force. Great. Uh, let's, let's switch to an operational topic because many of us are looking at China, uh, their economic rise, their military power rise. Uh, and I, I, I got to tell you, I really like uh, what you're telling the Air Force to accelerate, or, or yeah, to accelerate change or lose, because I, I think that's really accurate. Uh, because technology is changing so fast, um, you know, we really have to be, uh, be cognizant of what our potential adversaries are doing. Um, do you think that message is sitting in throughout the Air Force? And if so, are you, are you happy or pleased with the current pace of change in the Air Force? Well, uh, I am. Uh, I, I am happy with what's going on. It's really good to see the energies I talk to everybody and the feedback I get from uh, different people, uh, whether it's from our industry partners, whether it's from members on the Hill um, or airmen out in the field as I go out to visit them, is uh, they get it. They understand kind of, you know, we, we want to change. And I'll tell you, just because of all the things that have gone on in the course of the past year and a half with, you know, whether it be COVID, racial disparity, stand up with the Space Force, there's all these things that are driving change. And uh, I think they understand the, uh, particularly as you start looking at, at China and the things we talk about in our national defense strategy or the international uh, uh, security strategic guidance of China as a facing threat. And so our airmen get it. The challenge is when you're doing change, uh, you, you, depending on how you are, uh, your measurement is, you know, folks are looking for instant change, but some of the things we're doing are is a cultural shift, which will take more time. But the first, you know, in order to start change, you got to take that first step. 
And that's the part I'm proud of is the fact we are taking that first step. We're taking a hard look at ourselves uh, as an Air Force. And, and it's, it's going to drive some tough decisions uh, as we go forward. And, uh, but it's also how we empower them to drive change at a lower level. So it's change at the more strategic level. You know, here at the Pentagon, as we're working uh, with the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense and over on Capitol Hill. But it's the same thing that happens at our base level in our squadrons, groups, and wings of how they're able to drive change to make us a more uh, effective force. And it's, it's great to see the energy of our airmen, of the things they're able to do if we unleash them and, and empower them to make the decisions that they're able to do. And it really, to me, it boils down to trust that we at senior leaders trust them to do their job and they trust that their senior leadership uh, has their back um, as they try to go out and execute and be uh, innovative on how we change and make ourselves uh, better for this uh, strategic competition that we're in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know, China and Russia in particular. Sure. Now, uh, I, I'm almost positive. One thing you don't think about during your days or, or retirement, um, because you've got a lot to do and you've got a long ways to go. Um, that, that said, though, I, I know when I retired from the Air Force and, you know, I was in an office there close to yours, I didn't think about it either uh, because I worked right up to the last day. And it wasn't until after my retirement ceremony that I went home and I didn't have to go in the Pentagon the next day that I really started thinking about it. Um, so as but I'm sure, though, you have at least thought some about, you know, what would the next phase of, of the Brown family look like? And, and uh, you know, are there any passions you have or what do you see yourself doing when you retire from the Air Force? Well, I probably live in some place close to the water um, <laughs> where I can be in shorts and t-shirts most of the time is one. Um, I have a passion for barbecuing, so, uh, you know, I'll continue to, you know, use my smoker to uh, do brisket and ribs and the like. <laughs> Uh, but I also want to mix that up with leadership. And uh, I mean, I really enjoy talking about leadership. I, I still spend a lot of time studying leadership, even at this level. Uh, I like engaging and talking about leadership. And so I, I see myself uh, doing that kind of work, really working with young people uh, on leadership. Uh, I, I enjoy doing that. Uh, that. That's an aspect. And then, you know, the expertise I have as, the, uh, as an Air Force officer, uh, I think there's others I can do when you start looking at national security as well. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty much open. Uh, to, to a lot of different things, um, but uh, you know, Shereen's gonna want me to be close to the water someplace, and I've already got that feedback. So I, I know that that'll be one thing that we'll be working towards. But I, I do want to take some time to relax as well. But I think the key part is I still want to make a difference. I still want to contribute in, in some form or fashion. Okay, um, and let's talk about your family some. I know you've got uh, obviously Shereen. I know and your sons. Um, you know uh, how have you know your military career. Uh, you know, you've been in uh, quite a while uh, and, and they've been right there with you, supporting you. And I know, I know how that works. You know, you, you're not successful in the Air Force or the military without a supportive family. Um, so I, I, I know how supportive your family is. Um, but how, how does your family now, and they look at you as chief of staff and, and sort of all the assignments uh, that they went through and re, uh, remote assignments that you had to take and deployments. I mean, how's that whole family thing worked for you? It's worked fairly well. I mean, we're we're, we're pretty uh, we're, we're pretty tight knit, and uh, you know our our ability to to flex. And, our, and I'll tell you, one of the things we did when we started doing this, uh, the boys are probably you know middle school, is before each move we'd have, we sit down and have a family meeting, and we talk about okay here, here's what's coming next, and we'd get the you know quote you ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> So excited because we're gonna, you know, gonna go do something. So different personalities, uh, but you know, Shereen and I talk quite often about what we as a family want to do. And uh, I mean, there were there was a, a quick story uh, when I was a one star at CENTCOM, and uh, I was kind of, you know, I didn't know how much why I was going to do this. So I sat down with the boys uh, and Shereen. It was a Sunday after dinner. Uh, I mean, I'll never forget it. And I go, hey, what 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 do we think we should do? We wanna, you, you know, should we go ahead and retire and, and find something else to do, or uh, keep going. And the boys, the boys actually said, dad, you need to keep going. And, you know, I'm kind of glad they did say that because otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think they've been real supportive, but they, I think the other part for them, all, for all three, Shereen and both the boys, uh, the fact they have a chance to live their own life and uh, not to be able to say, here's what you got to do. Uh, you, you know, neither one of the boys are in the military, uh, allow them to do whatever they decide they wanted to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, 
I think we we're very humble about it too, because to them, I'm just dad. I'm not the chief of staff of the Air Force. And, uh, and so when we call and talk about, about you know, whatever's on their mind, uh, I talked to them, you know, father to son and, you know, Shereen, you know, uh, mother to son. Um, and then same thing, husband and wife for Shereen and I. So it's, uh, it's something we, we, you know, have the privilege to do, uh, but we're just who we are. And that's the thing I think for, for all of us, we're just uh, uh, humble servants and just, you know, honored to, to be part of uh, this great opportunity. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, because your experience uh, certainly mirrors mine and, and so many others in the military where, you know, I, I had the same conversation with my family and they, they had the same reaction, you know, keep going. Uh, and yes, I heard, you're kidding me, we're not going there on an assignment. You know, I've got a boyfriend, girlfriend, I'm on the football team. You know, that those things are hard on a family. I don't know, a lot of folks don't realize how tough and how much sacrifice military families make in addition to uh, the, the, the one that's serving in uniform. So Chief, one final question. Uh, and so when you're uh, about at the period I am, which is about five years from retirement, by the way, it goes by quickly. Um, um, and, and I see you uh, on the beach uh, sampling your brisket. Um, and I say, hey, Chief, and by the way, I'll still call you Chief. I say, I'll say, hey, Chief, um, looking back on your, your tour as Chief of Staff of the Air Force, um, what, what did you like best? I mean, what, 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 what was really fun about that job? What do you think your answer would be? Um, I, I would say making things happen. I, I would say every one of my, every job I've had in leadership, it was making something positive happen, um, that I could walk away from. And, I, you know, I can, I can look across a number of things and several jobs in the field. I can identify certain things I did, um, that I don't talk about, um, but I know that I had an impact on. And that to me is, because I don't do it by myself though. And I know that uh, it takes a team of folks to do this, but I'm, I'm a man of action. I like getting things done. Uh, I like to solve problems. And uh, I want to walk away from here and go, be able to look back and go, you know, there's a couple of problems I saw and the Air Force is still doing it. Uh, you know, that I was doing it because it was that important to the Air Force. They, they kept it even after CQ Brown is gone. And, and those are the kinds of things I want to be able to kind of lay in that uh, I don't necessarily have to have my name tied to it. I just want to make sure that whatever we do is uh, meaningful enough that the Air Force wants to continue to do it, you know, based on the, the background and environment that we're in. And uh, you know, it's, it's really about making a difference. And, and that's why, you know, uh, folks have asked me, you know, why I didn't go fly for the airlines. And, I mean, I, I just couldn't see myself at the front of the airplane and tell everybody thank you and goodbye. <laughs> uh, make a lot of money doing that, but uh, making a difference to me has kind of has been important. Um, I mean, really throughout my career. And I think that's probably one of the real reasons I stayed because I quit flying a lot a long time ago. And uh, so it's, it wasn't about the flying. It was more it's more about making a difference uh, for our airmen and our families. Sure. Well, uh, the 22nd Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General C.Q. Brown, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations again. I can't tell you how proud we all of you. Uh, we're all rooting for you. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're just proud to have you lead, leading the greatest Air Force in the world. You're the right man for the job. And so thank you for you and your family and Shireen in particular, what you all do every day for the greatest Air Force in the world. So thank you so much for joining us here today on Veterans in Transition. And we wish you nothing but the best in your future. All right, thanks, Larry. Pleasure being with you today. Thank you.